Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Q2015. I'm David Lundstrom, I'm BCC's Vice President of Marketing, and we are thrilled to have so many people here for Q. Welcome to Wisconsin. I know some of you probably came just for that opportunity, right? To come to Wisconsin. We have a lot of Wisconsin, the cheese, someone's already mentioned, it's a part of my deal here, so. Uh, we have a lot of great activities and events planned for you this week. This is our third queue. Uh, our second queue was about two years ago, and the first queue was two years before that, so we had very long crossfade transition times between queues. You are our biggest queue group and our most diverse group. We have people here from all over the world. If you're an international visitor, a visitor outside the U.S., including Canada, raise your hand. Right. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate the effort that you all have made taking time out of your, your lives to come here and be with us. Uh, the relationship that we have with our customers is very, very important to us at ETC. Our goal is to create great products and great services that allow you all to do your work. Um, artists, craftspeople, lighting technicians, educators. Uh, you come from all different walks of life. There's probably one thread that binds all of us here together, and it's a, a genuine interest in the arts and in the science behind the arts that so many of us work in. So we hope to reveal more of that science behind the arts to you. Uh, we created Q so that we could connect more fully with you as our customer group and that you could do the same with ETC. Learn about who we are, our culture, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. We want you to meet the people of ETC. That's very, very important to us. And we have an opportunity for you to do that. Did you get your yearbooks uh, when you arrive? They're in your packet. You know, we have a contest that uh, if you get a signature across every one of the ETC employees whose uh, pictures you will easily recognize in their, uh, their yearbooks, their high school graduation pictures. All of us are very well preserved. I think you'll find we all look the same. Uh, so start looking for us, and there'll also be plenty of opportunities for you to find us this evening. We are doing our very best work when we're supporting you. So help us learn how to do that when you interact with ETC employees. Tell us what we're doing right. Give us the feedback for things that we can do differently. We're really interested in hearing from you. We have great trainers for you. Creating an event for several hundred people who are here, we got great trainers from all over the world. About half of you will be focusing on lighting control consoles over the next three days, including a certification program that we've created. And our trainers are top notch. You're gonna hear from all of the people. Uh, Patrick Boozer from the West Coast is here. We have Ann Shear from the Midwest. Nick Simmons, all the way from the UK. All of these people are great programmers in their own right. Louis Malgrino, Ryan Phillips, and Abby Tutoro. So they've come from all over the United States and parts of the world to bring their knowledge and information as programmers and offer it to you. We hope that if you're doing that programming section, you'll leave here with a lot of confidence in the way you work and perform your arts on your ETC equipment. Some of you are educators and students, and you're in our continuing education track, and we're we're uh, really happy to have been able to work with Ann Archbold from the University of Wisconsin to put together an education track that will be very, very well suited for you as well. Uh, we have some other special guests. We're going to hear from Josh Allen, theater consultant, who's around here somewhere. There he is, Josh. You can wave your hand. Uh, we're really happy you're going to get to hear from Josh tomorrow morning. He's a forward thinker in theater spaces and uh, the equipment that supports those spaces. He's also fairly funny. So you can look forward at 8.15 tomorrow morning, maybe a little bit of humor. Um, and then someone who isn't in the room because of flight delays, um, Al Crawford is with us. And Al is a great designer in his own right uh, with his company Arc3 Design, designing special events all over the world, but also the lighting director for one of America's greatest dance companies, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. He's going to talk to us about recreating lighting uh, in theaters all over the world. He's passionate about uh, the work that he does in lighting and about the people of lighting, and I know that you'll enjoy him. Uh, both Josh and Al are doing a morning and an evening speech and then uh, a master class as well, so a great welcome to them. We have an information booth that many of you registered at. That'll be open throughout the weekend, so if you're unsure about something, 
all information comes from the information booth. We have a great evening lined up for you at the factory tonight. The ETC headquarters is just a few miles from here. And at 6 p.m. from the main hotels, the Hilton Hotel and the Best Western up the street, we'll have buses that are leaving. So if you've made alternate uh, plans for your, for your overnight stay, try to be at one of those areas around 6 p.m. to go out to the factory for fun at the factory. We've got a lot of activities for you out there, including... Uh, some skill and speed contests so you can get a little competitive, tours of the factory, uh, Wisconsin-style dinner, which inevitably means brats, probably, just in case you're interested. But I'm sure there's something for everyone. Um, tomorrow morning, we have uh, just two blocks up the road. We have our uh, state capitol and the town square for the city of Madison. We have uh, probably the nation's best farmer's market. It starts tomorrow morning between 6 and 6.30 a.m., so if you are an early riser or if you stay up very, very late, uh, <laughs> just beyond the farmer's market, there is State Street, and that's where you'll be if you're coming, staying up very, very late. Come back up State Street. Stop at the square. You can have a great breakfast there. Award-winning cheese from all over Wisconsin. You can buy cheese, and if you're concerned about getting your cheese home fresh, let me just tell you a little known fact. All Wisconsin hotels will store your cheese cold for you and give it to you upon checkout. It's just something every Wisconsin hotel will do. So feel free to buy <laughs> our award-winning dairy products and take them to the front desk and tell them, I told them, I told you, they will store it for you. <laughs> There's some really good stuff up there, but it is a great place for breakfast. Uh, just across the square, the Sunprint Cafe is one of my favorite places when I go to the farmer's market to have a great breakfast. So uh, we have a hashtag, because every event should have a hashtag, right? Hashtag ETCQ2015. We invite you to post on uh, social media, uh, which I'm sure you're all doing even as we speak, um, and let other people know about the experience that you're having here. Uh, we want to give a shout out to our media partner, Light and Sound America and Jackie Tian, who made it possible uh, for us to extend the reach of Q. Um, our own video staff is actually streaming six of these events at Q Live on the web. Um, so we're joined by several hundred people in this room and by several hundred people on the web extending this Q experience out. So we welcome all of our friends who are joining us on the web this morning and for those other five events as well. Um, I think that is about it for me. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Nick Wurzel, who's our National Entertainment Sales Manager. Good morning. Look at all of you. Wow. This is awesome. Welcome to Q3. Uh, before I get down to business, I would like to encourage everybody to kind of squeeze towards the middle, get to know your neighbor. We're still trying to, to fit people in. So kind of squeeze. If there are empty seats, you can squish in. Uh, streaming friends, if you want to change chairs while you're there, you can kind of feel the experience. This is just to keep you awake. Okay, now everybody move back. No, just. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, welcome. This is very, very exciting. We are so glad you're here. Uh, for Q3, I have been told very clearly that for me this is Q3 time three, so I'll keep this brief. So when I was asked to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Foster, I thought, oh man, how do you introduce Fred? And I thought, okay, I could tell the time at the company Christmas party, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> or the time at USIT, no, 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 no. So I have worked with Fred for over 20 years, and there's a lot of great stories, but a lot of it kind of revolves around the, the story of ETC, and he's certainly gonna talk about that. And along the way, we've had some you know, good taglines, 
that I will share with you. But before I do that, I want to remind everybody that the uh, ETC regional staff will be hanging out in Lounge A, also known as Ballroom A, also known as the Lizard Lounge. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or worries, please come visit us. The staff from each region of the, of the uh, country will be there to help you with anything you might need. But back to you know, some of our taglines. Earlier on, it was kind of like, we're from Wisconsin, don't you know? Now, when it worked sort of for a while. Uh, for a while there, we had layers of light. I remember that. That, that was good. Yeah, and recently, someone poked their head into my office and said, hey, what do you think about innovating creativity? I was like, huh, what? What, what do you think about innovating creativity? I thought, well, that's kind of awesome. Because that's really what we achieved to do. We are here to help designers and technicians and everybody who does the art of lighting advance what they can do with that. So innovating creativity is really a great catchphrase for what we do. And so Fred's going to tell you more about that. But I just want to remind you that you know, in, a, uh, in, a, in a certain way, the ETC story is your story. So I want you to remember that. Meet the people of ETC. I want to reinforce what David said. Meet the people of ETC. Help us to get to know you and what you need. So without too much further ado, I just want to introduce someone that a long time ago, and you yell at me for that, but a long time ago, in a garage not too far, far away, <laughs> a, a group of friends got together to create something Innovate Creativity. And with that, I would like to introduce Mr. Fred Foster, our CEO and founder and my friend. Good morning. Good morning. So about 40 years ago, almost to the day, I graduated from James Madison Memorial High School, which is on the west side of Madison. Four years before that, I had walked into my homeroom, which turned out to be the auditorium, and I looked up and I saw some spotlights, and I said, wow, that's kind of cool. And I basically didn't go to any other classes in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having to beg a credit, half a credit from the head of the English department for a stagecraft course that I didn't take, but I taught. I had Parker and Smith memorize cover to cover. Um, Madison, the University of Wisconsin, in Madison at that time had a great lighting professor, a man named Gilbert Hemsley. And he had been here for about five years after he had pissed Gene Rosenthal off and he thought he would never get another job in New York, so he came out to the bucolic Midwest to become a professor. But then he started to draw fabulous, fabulous students, both undergraduate and graduate students. So by 1975, I came into a lighting program that had 162 first semester lighting students in it, and about 15 graduate students that Gilbert would put in every performance space in Madison. One of the great things about studying with Gilbert, well, let me, let me step back a minute. One of the things I always say is that I'm incredibly arrogant now, but at 18, I was astoundingly arrogant. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna be the greatest lighting designer. I was certain of it, right? So I walked into this program and one of the things that was another feature of working with Gilbert is he would take us as students out when he worked professionally. And he was starting to work again in New York, um, really coming back into the opera circuit uh, through Boston and such. So as, at 18 years old, I was able to go to New York with Gilbert and spend two weeks at the Metropolitan Opera House. Basically, I got sandwiches for the production table. Um, <laughs> but during this time, I watched Gilbert light two operas, Lohengrin and um, Esclamond, and I remember being after a, a, the Esclamond, I think was a Zeffirelli production, we went up to the Metropolitan Opera boardroom after a rehearsal, and we each got a glass of scotch. I was bored. I got up and got another glass of scotch. I, I got back to the hotel, and Gilbert said, dear, you're not important enough for that second glass of scotch. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I got knocked down a peg, but I had a lot of pegs to go. Um, 
What happened is that I fell in love with opera houses. Not so much opera, but opera houses are amazing machines. The Met at that time had 65 electricians on any show call. Um, in Lohengrin, they brought a set on the Amsterdam Avenue Express, the upstage wagon, and for five minutes it came downstage and then settled into place with a herald trumpet going all the way around, and the lighting cue and the scenery move got a standing ovation. It was just awesome. However, it was 344 Ward Leonard and Dimmers being controlled by a 10-scene preset with two preset operators and one person doing crossfades. Back in Madison, in about 1973, Kliegel had um, sold a Q-file, one of the earliest memory systems, to the university, um, cost about $150,000. So I have an older brother. He's, uh, he calls me his younger brother, so I get to go the other direction now that we're older. Um, <laughs> and he was an electronics and physics nut. He was studying physics at the UW, so I brought him down to look at this. We'd always been talking about making dimmers or something where our interests lined up. He took one look at this thing, which was three racks of electronics. It actually wasn't a computer board, but it had core memory in it. And his direct quote, I remember so vividly, was, Gak, this is disgusting. We can do it for $5,000. <laughs> so the next, this was in the fall of 1975. Um, we went over to Gilbert's house, which um, is near the football stadium, to a party. And the way it worked with Gilbert, if you wanted to have a meeting with him, you'd talk to one of his handlers, and they'd set a, notionally set a time, but you'd wait until that time came along, hanging out at a party that never really ended. The porch you can see on the left side, interesting wafts of smoke would come out of that. Um, there was horrible Lambrusco wine, but um, <laughs> some of you know Gilbert, <laughs> I can hear. <laughs> and so we waited around. The other thing that would, there were two other things about meeting with Gilbert. When it finally became your turn, it would happen wherever there was enough room for the meeting, and anybody who, wanted to, who was at the party and wanted to be in the meeting could be there. So our meeting with my brother Bill, Gary Buick, one of the high school friends of my brother, they were both on the math club, oddly enough, and a guy named Jimmy Bradley and I went up to Gilbert's bedroom, which at 18 is a room that I really didn't aspire to spend much time in, but... Um, <laughs> And I remember that there were graduate students sitting on, um, on the dressers. Gilbert was kind of sprawled on the bed. And he said, well, dear, what do you want to do? And he said, we're going to build a Q-file. And we're going to sell it to the Met. And everybody in the room basically said, yeah, sure. So that kind of ticked us off. Um, we went back and spent the next year starting in the basement of my flat in Mound Street. So it's not really a garage. Um, and then uh, stealing scraping parts up off the floor of the physics department, and um, we built the first light board. So by Christmas Day of 1976, we had a, something we called MegaQ, because it did a 1,000 channels by a 1,000 cues. And this is it. This is me in our first marketing public shot. My father took it in his living room. Um, and basically, in a box a foot by a foot by three feet, it did everything the Q file did. And we took it back to Gilbert's house uh, Christmas Day morning. Probably the same party was going on. Um, <laughs> certainly a lot of the same people were there. We set it down on the table, and everybody said, dang. Well, they actually said a different word than that. <laughs> You've done it. What are you going to do? And I said, we, we're going to sell it to the Met. Well, um, we wanted to use it somewhere, so the first use of this was at the Union Theater, um, and I would suggest that if you have some free time in Madison, go down to the Union Terrace. It's part of the Student Union. It's a fabulous place to be. So we used it for a live production of Manon put on by the local opera company. This is Alan Edelman, who's a very successful designer, one of the graduate students at the time. He now does most of the live from Lincoln Center stuff. And this was a unique production because not only was it a live audience, but it was broadcast live on color television and broadcast live on public radio in stereo because there was no such thing as stereo color television at the time. Um, so it was really a unique thing. And Gilbert kind of coordinated and made this whole thing happen. And he invited a guy named Clem Lesio from the Met to come out and see how these fabulous things his students were doing. So here was my chance to sell this to the Met. The curtain came down opening night. 
Um, finally, it, and the Opera Guild ladies were waddling backstage to rub elbows with stars, and Gilbert brought Clem D'Alessio back, and this is when I learned about inrush current. All the lights had cooled down. Alan Edelman had hung every spotlight he could find in Madison. And Clem D'Alessio touched a button that said cut, and that instantly put all channels on to full. Well, in 1939, they did not anticipate needing that much power in this theater. <laughs> <laughs> so not only did the, the stage blackout, but the dressing rooms and the auditorium, it was a great, great time. I think it's fair to say that we did not get that order right then. Um, what did happen is we took it to a trade show, a use it trade show, and we ended up selling it to Berkey Color Tran. It became channel track. We supplied the face panel, the lower face panel with all the computer buttons on it, a computer board about that big with an Z, a four megahertz Z80 and 16K of dynamic, dynamic memory. Not gigabytes, not megabytes, none of that. Um, and a flop, eight inch floppy disk drive. We sold that to Colortran for the $5,000 Bill said we could sell it to them. We were a joke as a company. This is our first production facility. It is my brother's bedroom at my parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> you can see me in the lower right hand corner, Jimmy Bradley in the red shirt, and my brother with a cute little page boy thing happening. Um, just as a footnote, and this will make us all feel really comfortable, my brother went on to have a career in physics working at Fermilab. Then he retired from physics and now is a U.S. congressman representing a district in Illinois. So there you go. <laughs> Which is also ironic because we were once introduced at a sailboat regatta as Bill and Fred Foster, and the person said, which one is which? And our friend said, Bill's the one who thinks and Fred is the one who talks. So... <laughs> I was kind of pissed off until I really realized I was my brother's user interface. And, um, <laughs> and then I, um, uh, but over the course of time, now he's a politician, my big fear in life is he's going to learn how to talk, and then I'm going to have to learn how to think. So I'm thinking, so far, it's not a risk. Um, so we built about 150 of these things. and. I'm going to jump ahead in time to 1990, which is another time that ETC made a step change in our operations. Up until we were just making control consoles, and we had developed a control console for Disney that we did not sell to Colortran. So in about 1983 or so, we started selling it directly as an ETC product. But here we were making little control consoles, well, pretty decent control consoles at the time in Wisconsin and competing against Henry Strand and Kliegel and Colortran and Electro Controls who made the entire lighting system. So we teamed up with a couple of companies, Lighting Methods in Rochester, New York, Teatronics in California, and they made dimmers. There was a whole class of the industry called Alphabet Soup. We were all known by our initials, ETC, LMI, that sort of thing. So we teamed up with them, and at some point it made sense to put ETC and Lighting Methods together. Lighting Methods, started by Al Pfeiffer about the same day that we started ETC, had really developed the first truly digitally fired dimmer. No trim pots on the front of these suckers. And they were leading the way in technology, but we were two tiny companies. ETC was about 20 people and $2 million in sales. Lighting Methods was 65 people and maybe $5.5 million in sales. So we put the two companies together. We were going to merge them together, but Al Pfeiffer and I couldn't decide who would be king. So instead, we, a year later, it, he said, why don't you just buy the company? Because Al was an engineer and didn't want to um, manage people, and I kind of like people. So um, we ended up, it was like a mouse swallowing an elephant, if you think about it. We had 20 people. We moved 25 people from Rochester. By the end of 1990, we had added another 45 people to ETC, so we were about 85 people. Some of the things that... I'm very proud about that transition is it was terrible to stand up in front of the people in Rochester and say, I'm sorry, we're moving your company a thousand miles and we can't take many of you with us. But by the time we ended up operations in New York, we had found jobs for all but three people of the 65. 25 came with us, other people found jobs. Two were women who had extended single mothers with big families and they could make more money on AFDC payments if we fired them, so we did. And <laughs> one guy had a rap sheet that was just too long. Um, so, um, 
this was a time where we were really doing pretty well. Um, we were growing very quickly. One of our, we had picked up a new partner, a guy named Bob Gilson. We had bought Jimmy Bradley out, but Bob Gilson had a factory that made medical equipment, still does make medical, medical equipment, and had a big cornfield out back. So we'd say, hey, Bob, we need a new building. And he'd say, how big and when? And he'd plow out some more cornfield and build a new building. So by the end of 1990, um, we had to pave the parking lot. And oddly enough, I learned a lesson in the parking lot. Um, there are probably a lot of lessons you could learn in the parking lot, but this is not one of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the day we paved the parking lot, I arrived at work a little bit late, like 9.30 or something like that. And as I walked down, I had to park two blocks away, and I walked past a whole line of cars. And my office was in the very back of the top building there. So by the time I got back to my office, I felt sick to my stomach, and I couldn't figure out why. So I stopped, and I looked, stared out the window, which I actually do a little too much. And um, it took me an hour or so to sort it out. But what I really discovered at that moment, that ETC changed. If ETC had blown up, I dropped out of school, right? Um, if ETC had blown up, I would have gone back to college and gotten a real job. But all of a sudden, we were responsible for all of those car payments. And, so it was just a moment where my vision of the company changed. And now, however many years later, 25 years later, I guess it is, we have families, we have houses, we have children, we have grandchildren. It was a really, really big change in my mind. So in the later, in the 1990s, we grew and grew and grew. We introduced this kind of useful thing called a source four. Um, <laughs> We developed the Obsession console, which got us Broadway and finally got Four Star to buy something from us. Um, <laughs> and the, the sensor dimmer. So here were tremendous products. We were adding people left and right. By the middle of the 1990s, we expanded into Europe and into Asia. Um, and we were growing for the sake of growing. Bob Gilson, the new partner we brought in at some point, said, why are you spending all of your time growing and not making any money? We were taking every penny we made and put it back into growing. Why don't you just stop, get really good at what you do, and make a lot of money like we do? And I looked at his toy collection. He's got a 29 rank Wurlitzer theater organ in his factory. And I said, hmm, I guess I should probably think about this. So my father was a law professor at the university, and he only knew one businessman, a man named Marshall Erdman, who had started a company that grew to 800 people making medical clinics, prefabricated medical clinics. And interestingly enough, ETC's factory in Middleton was actually built by his company many, many years ago, later. So dad arranged lunch with Marshall and me, and Marshall had known me since I was this big, and he called me Freddie. And he said, um, oh, I missed the slide. Okay. He said, well, Freddie, tell me about your company. And I said then, what I will say any time you ask me what the best thing the, about the company is, I said, the best thing about ETC is we have the best people. He stopped me right there and he said, then you can't stop growing. I was pretty shocked, right? <laughs> How'd you get there that quickly? I thought I was going to get lunch out of this. And <laughs> <laughs> So what he pointed out is if it was in fact true that we had the greatest people, the best people in the industry, then we could never stop growing. Because if you do stop growing you, and stop offering opportunities to people, one of two terrible things is going to happen. Those great people will first say, this is, I'm stuck here, I'm going to go over here and beat you at your own game, or even worse, they might say, I'm OK with this, and just stagnate, and then keep anybody else coming up into the challenge. And it was another moment, like the parking lot, for me, thinking about ETC as a company. It created a couple of images in my mind. <laughs> One is a mushroom cloud that, as the, the um, mushroom expands, draws talent up through the stem. OK, there's kind of a more benign image I probably could have used. Um, <laughs> And the other is a treadmill you could never get off. I mean, the idea of constant growth, of constantly getting bigger and bigger and offering new opportunities turns out to be kind of a challenge. Another thing that I think ETC has done to, over the years is to develop some of the best tools for the highest level of the 
and lighting market, but then successfully bring those tools down to a market to make them accessible. Show of hands, how many of you have written a queue on an Express console? Okay. Um, on the live streaming people, I presume you've done it too. Um, it is, the Express is a pretty classic example of this. It had a tremendous amount of power. We sold 27,000 of these things. By the time we retired it, I did a calculation that if you lined them all up end to end, it would have been 17.2 miles of Express consoles. <laughs> So that's probably a lot of cues that are done. But what this would do is, I mean, still many theaters are using these. It's kind of astounding. So this has been one of our goals as we've grown. Yes, we always want to make the newest, shiniest, brightest thing. But we also want to make it the technology available to people who can't necessarily afford the newest, shiniest thing. So jumping ahead again, 2008, the Great Recession. We looked at this, we were having our best year ever. I think every company in our business was having their best year ever in 2008. Um, but then in September, the banking crisis hit and we were planning our budget for the next year and we were pretty sure we were gonna get hit pretty hard. We thought we were gonna get hit 10, 15%. But we set ourselves a couple of goals. Other than the time we bought lighting methods, only once in ETC's history had we ever had to lay people off and that was after the 9-11 tragedy and we had to let 63 people go and it was the worst thing. So we set ourselves the primary goal is we're not going to lose anybody. Every company seemed to take this as a get out of jail free card to lay people off. And we weren't going to do this. So we put in wage freezes. For 18 of the next 24 months, nobody at ETC got a raise. Um, we went a whole year, then we thought it was getting better, and then we had to put it back in. We cut every expense we could that didn't cost a job. The other situation was that since we were in good financial condition going into this, we figured that it was very important to develop new products because we were confident that the economy would recover eventually. We knew how long it took us to develop new products, so that gave the economy a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we felt that if we had the entire team together and a whole slew of new products, that we were going to be able to come out because again, as companies stopped employing people, they stopped developing products. So the first thing we decided to do was get into rigging. Now this is kind of a stretch for a lighting company to get into rigging. Um, I, I referenced it a little earlier. I was a sailboat racer, so I've always liked lines and pulleys. Um, and I've always felt there was a connection between lighting and rigging. And there's a real opportunity in rigging to bring automated rigging, which is inherently safer than counterweight systems, down to an affordable package so venues that couldn't afford automation could. And that's going to be done with the same techniques that we've done with dimming. A dimmer in, in 1975, a single dimmer channel cost $1,000. The CD80 dimmer dropped that down to $300, and the sensor dimmer dropped that down to $250. So if we can do the same thing with rigging, this is why we got into that. Then, the 2009, I'll tell you, 2008, I wouldn't touch an LED fixture with a 10-foot pole. Um, they were the devil's tool. Um, they, made, <laughs> they made really, really ugly light. Yeah, on a white wall, you can make 16.2 million colors, but if you try to make somebody's skin look good with an RGB LED, you're screwed. So we didn't want to get into that. And quite frankly, every, industry, every company in the business was taking an array of LEDs and putting them in something that looked like a park hand and said, we're newfangled, and we weren't going to do that. And then Novella Smith and Rob Gerlach came to us with a product they had developed called Celador. Novella's a lighting designer, and that's really a great way to start developing a lighting product, not as an engineer, but as a designer. Rob was an engineer. They had teamed up to come up and came up with this concept of, Let's find as many colors of LEDs as we can so we have as much of a spectrum as possible. They had gotten their company about as big as they could get it, and they approached us, and they were set up in the Century Theater, our demo theater in Middleton, and I was still pretty suspicious. So I walked down, and there's a Celador poster with a bunch of different colored dots, and I said, I'll teach you, and I got a Source 4 on a stick and rolled it out and put a piece of lead 201 in front of it and said, match this. So Novella wiggled these seven faders, and I said, damn, that's really pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And that is why we decided to get into, light, into LED lighting, because now there was a clear path of be, creating high quality light with the new technology. So five, four years ago when we did Q, um, the first time I premiered the source for LED. There was this period of time between LEDs coming out that at USITT in the student sessions, I would always ask Tom Littrell, when are you going to make an LED source for? And he would smile and say, ETC is always working on new and interesting things because he didn't want to lie and we didn't have a clue how to make a spotlight out of a profile out of LEDs and actually nobody really did. So we, there were four of these, maybe two of these things hung right up here and at the end I said, so here it is and showed what we could do with it. Um, and so I, I think at this point I'd like to talk a little bit about what LEDs have done over the years. In 2012, um, at Plaza, I was asked or given the opportunity to talk about anything I really wanted to, and I love that invitation. <laughs> um, so what I, my presentation was titled this, um, we need to join together to defend the quality of light, and then I realized I'm not a lighting designer and had, I had no right to talk about the quality of light, and I panicked a week before I had to give the talk as I normally do, and so I, um, I talked to, I sent emails to every lighting designer I could think of, Dwayne Schuler, Richard Pilbro, Ken Billington, uh, Rick Fisher, Pauly Constable, Neil Austin, and said, help, um, what is the quality of light? <laughs> and I got, it was a really interesting response I got, but um, what I ended up with the talk asking all the lighting designers in the audience to join the lunatic fringe, to join together to defend the quality of light. Now, to be honest, it was kind of a thinly veiled defense of the tungsten light bulb, which is pretty important to ETC, right? We, at that point, 70% of our revenue came from dimmers and source fours. Um, but it was really saying that don't get rid of tungsten unless there's something to replace it with. So I asked people to join the lunatic fringe and yell at the lab manufacturers to not stop making lamps, yell at the manufacturers, yell at the government to say, don't outlaw this stuff. And they followed, I gave the talk a couple of other times, it was in articles and translated into Russian and German, and I speak very good Russian, um, uh, I guess, into Chinese. Um, and they joined the lunatic fringe. <laughs> They created the Lunatic Fringe. They created a Facebook page, which is a Save Tungsten campaign. And really, everybody started saying, protect tungsten. So now, four years later, three, three years later, what are people saying? It was interesting. I contacted three designers who sent, we've been in contact with. Um, well, we're in contact with a lot of designers, but I personally had been in contact. The first was Neil Austin, who had won a Tony Award for Red. I don't know how many of you have seen it. I didn't see the show, but I've heard a lot about it. But this was a show lit entirely with not tungsten halogen, but incandescent lamps, not traditional spotlights, but almost factory sources, that sort of thing. And he got a Tony for it. Um, we had let him 23 units to use on a West End production of Shakespeare in Love, a play based on the movie. Um, he actually wanted 40, and that was a little cheeky, so he agreed to 23, thinking actually that a rental company would buy them and then rent them to them. Well, so in any case, um, he used them, working with Rob Halliday, and they started discovering pretty amazing things about them. When they wanted to pick a new color for their gel scrollers in front of normal tungsten, they would use the color picker on the EOS console with the LED light and say, yeah, that's the right color, and send in the order for the new, colors, uh, the new color string. The design, so now what is he saying? Uh, what is he saying? So now he's saying that tungsten will exist where silence is important and the budget is important, but he's now a convert to LED. It's kind of astounding. Another good friend is Rick Fisher. Um, he won a Tony for Billy Elliot, um, the musical, that's official name of it. Um, and Rick, again, we had lent him a few units to use in a small theater in Hampstead in London. And when he first used them, he hung 
a source four LED next to a traditional tungsten LED because he really wasn't certain he could live just with the tungsten or with the LED. So he wanted that confidence. And if you remember our earliest Layers of Light talks, we were proponents, I'm sorry, I'm falling apart here. Um, we were proponents of mixing tungsten, at the gorgeousness of tungsten with LED lighting. Recently, he's used them on Broadway shows and in operas, and his position is changing somewhat. He's saying that instead of being the, the LED being the specialist fixture, the unique fixture you use occasionally, he sees LED lighting, the seven color system, X7 system, being the primary and tungsten becoming the secondary source. Wow. This is three years since the call to arms. And the, one of the last people I've contacted is Polly Constable. She's the most recent Tony Award winner for um, the best play this year. She um, did War Horse. Many of you have probably seen War Horse. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous lighting, job of lighting, a fantastic show. Polly writes about, or spoke about her, her strategy and process for lighting design. She gets her inspiration for lighting by the sun shining through the mists of the trees as she runs in the morning. This is a natural lighting design. She's incredibly observant. So what did she say? She sent me an email with this line in it. <laughs> I had to check the address line to see if it was really Polly. <laughs> <laughs> she can imagine a world without tungsten, or a world with certainly much less. Wow. So this change is happening. The technology is going very fast. And it kind of raises a question. Uh, well, no. um, before it raises a question, it does raise a question, but I'll get back to that later. I'm going to fix my string here. No, I'm not. Um, OK, so today, as I've been talking now, for about a third of the time I've been talking, I've been lit by pure tungsten. For about a third of the time, I've been lit by Source 4 Series 2 with the X7 some color system. And about a third of the time, I've been lit by the red, green, blue, lime color system in our color source. And you haven't noticed the change, have you? OK, so let's try it. Um, Tom, do you want to give me the, you know, we're missing a whole set of laps over here. But beyond that, OK. <laughs> Dimmer check. Um, <laughs> this is the pure tungsten, a source four. This is a series, the X7, series two. And this is a color source RGB line. Not a lot of difference, is there? You might have noticed quite a difference on the cloth. Thankfully, you didn't notice much on my skin. The cloth of many colors probably changed a good bit. You lose the color depth as you go down to four colors, but it's still pretty fine. However, a lot of the audience, we hope, is live streaming this. And if you saw those three cues bump on your monitors, you would have seen a change. Because television cameras see light different than our eyes do. So we've created three cues, the same three cues in concept, that look the same on video. So let's go back and do the video cue for Tungsten. And now the Series 7, or Series 2. And now the color source. To the, I'm hearing people go, hmm, here. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hearing people online saying, no kidding. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but what this really points out to is something that kind of bothers me about lighting. When there's an event that is being broadcast live on television with a live audience, the television designers don't give a damn about what you see in the audience. Right. They care about what it looks like on their monitor or what the engineers see on their waveforms. It may be that LEDs can solve this problem. About three years ago, one of our founders, Gary Buick, came back from his career in physics and electronics and said, I'm bored. What can I do for ETC? And I said, well, Gary, We've got this color system that we don't really understand. Can you figure it out for us? And he has spent two or three years understanding the science of color, not the art. He can't, you know, he dresses worse than I do. Um, <laughs> but what he's done is to really refine mathematical models that are starting to be put into our products. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Um, so a real question is, is tungsten a passing fad? I'm going to go to, I will say it is not a passing fad. We will always need tungsten. I don't think there's going to be an artificial, well, it's an artificial source, but I, <laughs> I don't think there's going to be a, tech, a source that ever gives us that full spectrum light, and there's sometimes it's going to be perfect. But LEDs bring so much more to the game, or some new things to the game. So in 2014, we were planning, or 2013, we were planning our budget for 2014. We're a real company. We make budgets. Um, <laughs> well, okay, I don't do that so much, but Dick Titus and the gang does. Um, so we looked at it, and we started sensing the economy was recovering. And when we come up with a new big announcement, I have a company meeting in Town Square, and my tradition is to sit on a rolling rack. Um, and I announced to the company that it was time to start growing again. Because since the recession hit, we really had circled our wagons and been very def in a defensive posture, with the exception of rigging and LEDs. Um, and so it was time now to start growing. Now, why did we say that? Marshall Erdman is why we said that. Because during that four years of recession, we weren't as busy, and Dick Titus and Julie Simbalak had put together a professional development program for employees. People were learning more, and, and if we didn't start offering opportunities to these great people, we would lose them. So I got to tell you, while I'm a man who loves to spin a lot of plates, when you tell about 800 people that you want to come up with creative ways to grow the company, it gets scary. <laughs> so many ideas, so much stuff is happening. So some of the things that happen in rigging, Somebody says, let's buy a competitor. What a great idea. Let's do this in like six months and move them to Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> but once you do that, you have to build yourself a factory with eight one-ton jib cranes, bridge cranes, feeding two five-ton bridge cranes, feeding one 10-ton bridge crane. You have to build a real factory. And I got to tell you again, in 1975, I never would have thought that ETC would need that we would even need a chain hoist. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> in power control, which we used to call dimming, there's a change with LEDs. It's to intelligently switched systems rather than dimming. So we have sensor IQ, which you'll just see for the first time here, and the echo relay panel, as well as just a whole slew of other products. In the architectural um, market, we have a Again, everything from the move to distributed control requires smaller um, switching devices. It's more about networking and distribution of data. Control, Gary's work on the subtle color control is now coming into the EOS family in release 2.3, I think I got that right, yep. Um, and what we are doing in this, you're seeing just the tip of the iceberg of what I believe we can do with color manipulation. Color control is the newest frontier in lighting control because we really, with CMY systems, you can only mix a color one way. With seven colors of LEDs, you can mix that same color a virtually infinite number of ways. So um, the, you'll see that this little graph down on the right allows you to take any emitter, keeping the color point the same, and add more red to it, and watch all the other LED colors adjust. It's unique. EDC can do this because we make the fixtures, we make the networking and connective tissue, and we make the consoles. It's really a very exciting time. As you leave here, you'll see our two, two of our newest products. Um, they are programming wings for our main control desk lines. They're USB devices that could be plugged into the ETC Nomad Puck or ETC Nomad software running on a laptop or into any variety of our RVUs and be part of your network system. So we have the Cobalt programming wing and the EOS programming wing. The EOS programming wing takes um, all of the buttons from a uh, geo console and gives you all of that flexibility plugged into a laptop. So what are we learning here? We're learning, we learned from Express. We're taking the power of our incredibly sophisticated control desks and bringing them to a level that they're affordable to another level of the market. In Luminaires, we introduced the Source 4 Series 2. 
the color source PAR, um, which is, it's a four color system, RGB, lime. Actually, to be honest, it's the pirate light because we have twice as many red circuits in it, so it's RRGB lime. <laughs> And, ta-da, product reveal. <laughs> the all-new color source spot. I can get you into this baby. <laughs> for about $1,700, which is about $1,000 less than the color source, or the, than the Series 2 um, Source 4 LED. It uses the same color system as the, the RRGB, the pirate color system. It uses all of the lens tubes that, um, and lens barrels and accessories that the Source 4 does at an affordable price. So why don't you, why are you still gonna buy Series 2? You will, because it has that incredible color flexibility. This is being only a four color system, you can do some of those metameric changes, but not the wonderful cues. I think I probably actually missed a cue, didn't I, um, back there, but the little like cue, but oh well. Um, so uh, you'll see all about this, um, learn all about this uh, today, tomorrow, and the next day, I guess. Not quite as exciting as the first LED thing I introduced, but I guess I would like to finish the, the way I, th I finish really all of my talks. ETC isn't about the products or the technology, it's about the people of ETC. This summer, we're probably gonna break 1,000 employees for the first time. It's kind of an amazing thing. Um, I'm incredibly proud to work with everybody, and equally, I'm thrilled that you choose to come here and join ETC and learn about us, take the time. You are, as David said earlier, you're actually more important than the spotlights and I thank you for being our customers. So, just briefly, are there any questions? Nope, oh yes. Bring sexy back. Um, the question was phrased that obsession was, I presume you mean obsession two, the bat board? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> obsession one, not so sexy. Um, uh, can we bring sexy back? Uh, <laughs> I've not been asked that before. <laughs> I'm probably not the man to do that. Well, actually, I am in the sense that I'm the aesthetic police. You always have to fight for um, form over function if you're an, an, an industrial designer. Um, I do think that sex sells in lighting equipment. If you want a bright light, but it wants to have the knobs and buttons in the right place. It wants to look good. Um, Interestingly enough, there's a man named Dave Liu who did the original industrial design of the Source 4. He works in our LA office. He worked with Dave Cunningham when he developed it. And when we came out with the Source 4, we were doing the Source 4 LED, he was doing the industrial design of the back end. And his first version of it looked like a mailbox. And I said, no, Dave, 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 that's not right. You have to appreciate it has to refer to the, ET, to the Source 4 styling. And he said, well, I never liked that. 20 years ago, I didn't like that. And I said, well, do me a favor. Right now, Google Spotlight and go to images. And the whole page fills up with the silhouettes of the Source 4, right? <laughs> it becomes iconic. And so that does sell. I mean, the fact that it seems like most of our competition in LED light engines say they work with industry standard lens tubes. Seriously, this is one of the hard parts, we should get credit for it, and we deserve it. Um, so styling is important. Um, actually, if you remember on the Obsession 2, the sculpted place with the go button on it, I remember Joe DiNardo, who was our salesman, our sales manager in New York, saying, you need to build a throne for the light board operator, because Broadway electricians spend their entire career hitting the go button, so they might as well be comfortable. 
<laughs> okay. Any other questions? So what was the balance between the mushroom cloud and the hamster wheel? There's, there's not a balance. Um, you don't, for a while back I learned that the advantage that you, it's not the best thing to brag about how many people you have from a running a business standpoint, you want to do more with less. Um, I remember a time when we had just reached some sales goal, you know, some number of million dollars that we were selling, and I went on a sales tour in, with Mike Griffith, who is our West Coast Regional, and everywhere, every place I stopped, I bragged about we had just become a company this big. And after the third time, he took me out in the parking lot and he said, if you say that again, I'm going to punch you in the nose. And I said, why? He said, no, none of our customers wants ETC to be bigger because that makes the customer seem smaller in relation to the company. Um, the, you know, we've had customers 40 years. For 40 years, we've had customers that are still our customers. And they remember when they could call up and get us to write a new, send them an EEPROM with a new, um, a new function the next night. And you can't get that from us now. So bigger in many people's minds is not better. Um, what I will say about bigger is better is that we can do so much. It, you know, I, I give a lot of factory tours, and I walk around into a new part, or to a part of the factory, and my tours often go, and this is where we used to build distribution. Let's go find it. <laughs> <laughs> and more recently, I've been discovering things that I didn't even know processes, even products, that I didn't know we made. And I say, oh my god, I've got to know about this. Who, who's doing this without my approval? And, <laughs> <laughs> and when I scrape one layer of paint off, what I find is there's a whole team, an army of people who have, are responsible for that, who are passionate about whatever that thing is. And that's a great thing about getting bigger. If you have the right people and the, a great company. Okay, great. Go Q3. I got to say it after all. <laughs>